Um, yeah. And uh, one of the things, my, my uncle owned a store in Seldom, and I would spend in my afternoons, I'd spend hours there. And I'd help him out. I'd pump gas or I'd, you know, clean up a bit. And I, I, I really, and I still value the time I spend with, with Uncle Al. I, I don't get to do it very, very much now these days. But, uh, you, you know, we, we went on to be great friends and whatever else. But one of the, the funny things, and I, I continue to bring up this story, was there's a part of the island that will drop their, um, uh, 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 replace their V's with F's. Yes. No matter what, they'll always draw, replace their V's with S, and that they'll do the likewise to 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 the the other way. They'll they'll do it with the replace their S with their V's as well, um, which I always found uh, amazing, and uh, I, I really couldn't wrap my head around it. And one thing we always had to do in the store, no matter what, everybody was a customer, so so you're always respectful. So you never. Um, you, you would laugh with everybody for sure, but you never laughed at anybody. That was uh, uh, an, un, an unwritten rule, if you will. But I remember one day somebody came in the store and asked my uncle Al, he said, Al, boy, I, I don't suppose you got any of that thick vapor rub. <laughs> and I was standing there like, what, what, did, he, what did he say? Like, I, I, like, you could clearly see the look on my face was confusion. Like, what did he just like? What, what did he ask for? <laughs> And Uncle Al said, "No, boy, we, we don't we don't have any of that here. You gotta go to the drugstore for that." You know, because you know, the drugstore was in Fogo then, in, in the main community right. of Fogo. Oh, he said, "Now I gotta go get my fan and drive all the way to Fogo." Yeah. And 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 I stood there. And I was like, "Am I living in this bizarro world?" Like it's I just so couldn't wrap true. my head around it. It's but that's so that's the reality. True. So the the fact that you know so I was telling somebody about this um, at my workplace who's never been to Newfoundland and now wants to go, but I they, I told them and I told them a couple of other stories and they say how is it you've only wrote, written one book because if you spend time in that store you must have enough for volume after volume after volume and it's true it's true that store was um, a place of observation but you know. Uh, Alistair McLeod was, was interviewed once, and, and he he got a bit of flack for writing um, No Great Mischief and, and even Islands, some of his short stories from Islands. He got a bit of flack because he never grew up there. He, right. Kind of like, like like me and kind of like you to, to an extent. He, he'd been all over Canada. He was I, I think he was born in North Battleford. I'm not positive on that, or maybe Hamilton. I, I can't remember either way, but um, he, he was a summer kid. And did eventually live there for a while and, and uh, uh, whatever. And somebody locally said, kind of, how dare you write about this place as though you, you're you from here and you grew up here, but you, you didn't. And he, he had answered the person with, you have to go away before you understand where you were. Yeah. To really understand a place, you have to go away from it to really understand it. Now, I, I'm saying that carefully because I know some people on Fogo Island who've never been away, who they understand that place way better than I ever will. Uh, but at the same time, I, I see his point, and, and I, I see what he what, what what he means. Somebody can ask me to describe Scarborough, and, and I I don't know where to start, right? But when I describe Scarborough versus downtown Toronto, your experience in downtown Toronto, well, those are two different experiences. Right. Right, completely two different experiences Absolutely. because they're two different places. Um, but I, it was—I'll I'll tell you, and Carolyn, as a writer, you probably experienced this yourself. In writing this, I, I, I was depending upon my memory, and, and as you know, when you're you're depending upon your memory and you, you're trying to get a story out, sometimes you just have to you, know, you have to improvise as well. Uh, but in going back twenty, thirty sometimes 40 years in, in, in recollecting some of these stories and some of these people, it was almost like I was revisiting them. Right. It was almost like I was able to um, go back into that kitchen, open that door from the porch into the kitchen and, and feel the heat from the bread uh, in the oven and, and uh, see Nan there in her apron and pop in his rocking chair and, and, take my spot on the day bed and have a good old yarn. Right. You know, like it, it almost felt like that in a way. So it, it was, 
it was a pleasure writing it. Like I, I can't think of anything that I've, I've worked at that was more enjoyable than writing this book because of that reason. And, and even though there's some chapters in there that weren't very pleasant to write about, that were about harder issues as my, my grandmother, um, you know, entered, entered the world of dementia and whatever else, I still found it important. I still found it that, that we, we need to write about these things. We need to tell the people who are in the generation after us and, and the one after that even about what that place was like and, and the context in which these people lived and the context in which we lived. And I think it's um, it, really interesting as well, Carolyn, and, and I don't mean to talk your ear off here, Writers, they always got too much to say. That's the problem. Um, <laughs> a, a lot of people write about international immigration, and I think it's a very important topic to, to write about, but not a lot of people write about domestic immigration. Right. That's a fairly, um, it's a fairly new topic. Or, sorry, inter, uh, 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 domestic migration, I should say. Right. Um, it's a fairly new topic that's written about. So I, I think it's important that people people get their pens out and they write and they document and they document and they document. So I, I hope um, my, my kick at that, at that can is, is through apps to gate. And I hope a lot of people enjoy it and maybe, maybe are able to identify with, with a part of it along the way. It's um, I've been listening to the podcast, so I've had a bit of a sample. And just so I should mention that you have as a, a, a companion to the book, you do have podcasts that you're doing online, uh, which are great. I've listened to a couple of them and I'll certainly be uh, listening to more. Um, the stories are that, you know, Newfoundland tradition is the stories are told, you know, they're, they're written down as a record, but really the stories are told. You've, you've kind of told us some today um, that uh, really, I don't know, paint a picture of of the people, like the story about the, that you just told about the fellow with the the van, <laughs> the fan going yeah. to vote. I mean, that is so real. That is so accurate. But I think sometimes, you know, we, we get custodial over our stories, right? Okay, this is my story. This is my story. And, and even as a person from a place, okay, this is Change Island stories. And so we don't want other people to tell them. But I think sometimes we need to have our stories uh, represented through other lenses so that we just get a clear idea. And I think it's important for people to understand that as a writer, if I take the time to write a story or to tell a story about you or that place or this place, it's because you've made an impression, you've made an impact. Um, you've risen to the top because writers have a million things they could be writing about. And so when we pick a topic and write that and make that the priority and write that story um, and you look at the content, and you know, as you said, who you don't have the right to, you know, tell these stories because not you, but the, the person you were speaking of, that person was telling those stories uh, in those books because they had made an impression and they'd been given value and so, you know, as a Newfoundlander myself, when I read stories about us, even though I sometimes think, I think they kind of missed it here a little bit, but they missed it because that, that was their impression. That was what they saw. And I don't have to agree, but I really appreciate when people take the time to write about us or tell our stories in film or tell our stories on the stage, uh, mm -hmm. you know, come from away and Broadway right now is huge. And um, I really appreciate that, even if it doesn't always um, show us in hit the mark, uh, right? Or yeah. show us in the best light, or even though come from away obviously shows us in a fantastic light. Um, I always worried when people come that they're going to be a little disappointed because it's like <laughs> we're just regular people here, <laughs> you know, doing our thing. Uh, but yeah, yeah, but, yeah, um, no, for sure. You know, that is something that I always um, try to tell people who want to write about uh, us, you know, because I do encounter a lot of writers, not just from Newfoundland, but from everywhere. And, and uh, there's always a battle with writers to, uh, should I do that topic? Is that appropriate? Can I represent 
that well enough. But if it speaks to you and you really want to write that story, I think uh, you're, it's a valid story to write from your perspective because um, we need to see that. And some of us get to go away and experience our places after going to other places and, and, and have comparisons and some of us don't. And uh, for those that don't, maybe uh, that perspective might be uh, something they could read and, and uh, take a little bit of knowledge from and say, oh, they look at us like that. Oh, we're not like that at all. But then sometimes it's so familiar because that story about the van was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was perfect. Well, so I, I I I think that as well. And there's a fellow who I spent a bit of time with, who was a minister in Seldon at the time. His name is Jamie Gripton, the late great Jamie Gripton, um, who uh, was the United Minister there. And the, the manse was just down the road from my my grandparents. And this young guy, he was a, a minister from Toronto, who literally, uh, he told me when he graduated, he had his roommate blindfold him and push him towards a map of Canada with a thumbtack in his hand and land, landed round about Fogo Island. Um, so he truly, you know, a, a man of God put his, his future in God's hands and, and ended up there. And uh, him and I stayed in touch after he, he had left Fogo Island. He, he went off to the Caribbean at one point, I believe, and ended up in, in New Brunswick. I, I think it was New Brunswick. And um, when we reconnected at one point, he said to me, he said, Sean, he said, you and I got to experience for a while before it shed its skin. And I thought that was a very interesting thing to say. And, and my perception was um, when we were there, there was only two channels on TV. There was NTV and CBC, and that was it. That was it. Now, that's all yeah. we got. And after supper, you would look out the window, and you'd see people leaving their house and going for a walk with their carriages and their strollers and you know, people stopping, talking to one another and whatever else. And just, just as he was leaving, they got the 14 channels. Right. As everybody deserves. Everybody, like new technology is, is available. Everybody deserves it. But it, it couldn't help but compromise this, this place in time. You know, I, I, I would, um, I, I don't know. I can't speak to this with authority, but I knew when I was there, in those summers, everybody was a wicked card player. Right. Everybody's really good at cards and everybody's really good at telling jokes and everybody's really good at, at, at you know, we go to dances and everybody would dance because that, that's what you did. Like we just all had time that wasn't taken up by the television or, or by electronics or personal devices or, or whatever. And these were times that you would just find yourself with friends for hours and hours and hours on end sharing stories, exchanging experiences or whatever, and, and not knowing that we were building these skills that the rest of Canada, by the way, covets. They, they, when they talk about Newfoundlanders in a workplace, uh, my, my background vocationally is in sales and marketing. Sales managers love Newfoundlanders. Marketers love Newfoundlanders because we're such great communicators, not right. to stereotype, but quite often we are. And, and those kind of skills often can't be taught in a classroom, um, but they can be taught um, sitting around a bonfire <laughs> at, uh, on, on some beach where you're watching an electric storm that's happening miles and miles and miles away, and you're just fascinated by it because, you know, you're completely dry. The rain isn't even here, but this electric storm that's happening over the Atlantic is the most incredible thing that you've ever seen in your life. And you've got hours to discuss it right. or discuss whatever. So, you know, that, that experience, um, I, I, like you said, I, I love when people write about Newfoundland, even if they don't hit the mark. And, and sometimes I, I, I will say this as well, even when I'm telling that story about my uncle Al's store, one thing I tried really, really hard to do is I tried to make sure that I was always very respectful um, and make sure that I'm laughing with, like the saying says, laughing with, not at. Um, because the 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 one thing I, I never, I, I, I don't tolerate um, is making fun of Newfoundland, making fun of Newfoundlanders. 
those old perceptions. 